And now friends, on this holy day, let us gather in peace and unity. Let us be one before the grace and grandeur of life. Let us be as children before its mystery and as seekers of its wisdom. Let us proclaim goodness as our gospel and hope as our strength and service as our responsibility to neighbor and stranger. In this hour, may we know anew the holy joy of human lives growing together in love and care, so that this hour will imbue all those to come with that sacred awareness. Come, let us worship together. Our chalice lighting this morning comes from Alan Deal. The light of this chalice is a frail thing. It can be snuffed out by the winds of cynicism and apathy. May its little frame be a reminder of the power of the spirit. Let us rededicate ourselves to providing light that lifts our hearts and increases the world's joy. There's an old story about a man riding on a horse that is galloping very quickly, seemingly out of control through town. From far away, people can hear him shouting, watch out, coming through, get out of the way, as the horse barrels toward them. The people dive for the sides of the road to avoid being trampled, and as the man on the horse nears them, one person calls out, slow down, why the rush, where are you going? The man calls back from atop the horse, I don't know where I'm going, you have to ask the horse. Such is really a parable for these particular days when we find ourselves atop horses of great stride and pace and uncertainty, a global pandemic likely turning endemic, war and conflict in several places, deadly political dissent here at home, a state of politics that is extreme, polarized, cynical, and untrustworthy, a media landscape that leaves few objective options, resurgent racism, rollbacks and barriers to civil rights for women and trans people, a planet growing hotter and hotter, and the best show on Netflix, Pivoting, was canceled after just one short season. The days are such that we journey through thickets of strife at such speed that everything blurs and blends. Like the trees along the interstate that we fly by, the landscape becomes an indistinguishable forest of concerns through which we barrel, wanting to or feeling like we should notice and respond to each one. Since that is impossible, we eventually become dispirited, overwhelmed. Perhaps we tune out completely. Perhaps we close our eyes and pray and hope that the horse ends up in a nice field with a stream and an apple tree and that we aren't thrown off somewhere along the way. Perhaps we want to stop and help, stop and offer a blessing, a hand, a word, a meal. Our bodies knowing pain, knowing anxiety want this. Our minds craving the peace of service want this too. But there are so many things to do. It may help to know that the roots of this parable about the out-of-control horse are Buddhist and ancient and grounded in China. It was first told in a time long, long ago in a land far, far away, so there must be something universal about today's condition. Ancient scriptures and stories of any faith are good for reminding us of that. Even if we're not of their culture, they do teach us that the impossible conditions for humans today were impossible for humans a long time ago as well. And they teach us that ancient humans were resilient and they endured and that we can too. We can keep going. The troubles we face are new to us, but they're connected to those of the past, as are we, all interconnected. And the ancestor's ability to endure and be resilient comes to us through a great web of humanity that stretches through time past and that to come. And as we are blessed by the ancestors, so may we bless those to come with our own resilience and creativity and community. As they endured, so may we, and so others may as well. Why? Because there are always children. There is always new life, and they deserve nothing less than our best model, our best efforts, our toughest resilience, our strongest will, and our most faithful lives. Indeed, we should turn to, the, to ancient wisdom regularly, if for no other reason than to be reminded that we are not the first nor final people to feel like the horse is out of control and that we're not sure where we're going or if we're going to get there or even if we want to. We might, we might want to jump off the horse into the thickets. There are ancient stories about that, too. Jonah ends up doing that through his disobedience. He jumps off the plan God has for him and ends up in the belly of a whale. 
Then in this time-honored Hebrew scripture, the whale vomits him up upon dry land, wherein he decides to get back on the metaphorical horse and follow God's commandment. To get there, though, he had to get thrown off his ship by his shipmates in the middle of the sea, who knew that his disobedience was causing God's storm-filled wrath to threaten all their lives. He had to almost drown in the ocean, get swallowed by a great fish, live in the fish's belly for three days, and then get heaved out upon dry land. That's what it took to teach Jonah that the horse was in charge and that he better just stay on it, acting as he could to influence the journey while also realizing that he was ultimately not in control. Ancient Buddhists taught this sparsely through a simple parable about a horse on land and people talking to one another. Ancient Israelites got real specific and creative. You're going to end up in the belly of a whale if you don't change your ways. In either case, if only it were that easy for us. A fraught conversation comes and goes, or we endure the trial of living in a sea creature and we come out aware of who we should be and what we should do on this ancient and always new journey through the thickets. We come out tested and assured, bearing the gift not of intelligence, but of wisdom, which contains perspective and faith and curiosity. Wisdom is of humility and humor and trial and error. It offers perspective and balance and moderation, all good tools with which to journey through chaotic times. It's hard to find balance in days like these, to maintain the energy to do something, to develop the discipline for spiritual growth as part of justice making. The modern writer in his, the modern writer Richard Rohr considers this by, by commenting on a well-noted dualism between choosing a life of contemplation or a life of action. Rohr writes, I have witnessed how many of us attached to contemplation or action for the wrong reasons. Introverts use contemplation to affirm quiet time. Those with the luxury of free time sometimes use it for navel gazing. On the other hand, some activists see our call to action as an affirmation of their particular agenda and not much else. Neither is the delicate balance in art that we hope to affirm. He continues, by contemplation, we mean the deliberate seeking of God through a willingness to detach from the passing self the tyranny of emotions, and the false promises of the world. Action, as we are using the world, word, means a decisive commitment toward involvement and engagement in the social order. Issues will not be resolved by mere reflection, discussion, or even prayer. Nor will they be resolved by protests, boycotts, or even, unfortunately, voting the right way. Rather, God works together with all those who love. He's referencing a line from Romans in the Christian scriptures there in the end, one in which Paul writes that love is what calls us to work for the good, and that love is of God. In our faith, it doesn't have to be the God that Paul imagined or any of the many that sprung forth from his writings, but the love comes from something larger than us, for sure, and it's directed at something larger than us, for sure, as well. It's not a love just of our making that only cares about us and our feelings and comfort. We didn't create it. We're not at the center of its concerns, and it continually draws us out of concern for the self and toward concern for neighbor, for stranger, and for enemy. That love continually links us in an endless interconnected web of time and space where we are much less one than we are one of many. We can have faith that this love is all about us, but it has to be all about everyone else too. If we are the center of it, it has to be an endless center. The first reading from this morning reminds me of this when Deepa Iyer is writing about what a cardinal mother-to-be teaches her. As she watches her animal kin, that mother bird is enacting in her days a love that preceded her and will grow beyond her, an instinctual love that assures continuation and blesses the world with beauty and flight and song, an embodied love that brought through one body another into being a generational love passed down to her and given to one to come, and an evolutionary love, the kind in which we all participate and none of us controls because it's too big and too timeless. That mother reflects love in a focused way too. Her life is about that emerging life. I think of Ayer's meditation as a counter to those blurry trees flying past on the interstate, to the overwhelming sense of all there is to do because so much is so wrong. For it helps to remember that even in those trees that we are flying past, those mother birds are present, focused on only one thing, and deer and chipmunk 
and fox and skunk too are all there, all as Iyer describes it, focused and aligned on what's before them. And what was before that mother cardinal was what she focused on that and only that. And later on, she'll probably take on other roles in life. Deepa Iyer is big on roles and clarity about various paths to justice making. She created what she calls a social change ecosystem map. So when you Google it, that's what you want. It's Iyer, I-Y-E-R, and the title is Social Change Ecosystem Map. That'll take you there which has 10 roles that people fill in trying to change the world. And the values and of which these roles are in service of are equity, liberation, justice, and solidarity. So all of these roles serve those values, equity, liberation, justice, and solidarity. By way of comparison for Jonah, the central value that we seek to serve would have been obedience to God. For Paul, it would have been God's love in the form of congregations. Paul was a church builder. For Roar, it would also be a love, but one that is served through a life of contemplation and action, the sort of engaged love that changes the world and grows the spirit. Iyer isn't writing from a faith perspective, so she just centers the values right in the middle of the map. And people of various faiths can then center the values in whatever source they serve in life. That's the part that we would answer with great diversity in our faith. Probably not so much the values, but where we source them in our lives. She then moves on to these 10 roles for creating social change. I'm going to list them with very brief descriptions that she writes. And as I do so, I invite you to think about which one or several appeal to you. And equally important, which one or several you would never want to embody, embody. There is the name of each role and then a short statement that she wrote imagining she's the holder of that role. So see which ones you affirm. In creating social change, the roles are weavers. I see through lines of connectivity between people, places, organizations, ideas, and movements. There are experimenters. I innovate, pioneer, and invent. I take risks and course correct as needed. There are frontline responders. I address community crises by marshalling and organizing resources, networks, and messages. Visionaries. I imagine and generate our boldest possibilities, hopes and dreams, and remind us of our direction. Builders. I develop, organize, and implement ideas, practices, people, and resources in service of a collective vision. Caregivers. I nurture and nourish the people around me by creating and sustaining a community of care, joy, and connection. Disruptors. I take uncomfortable and risky actions to shake up the status quo, to raise awareness, and to build power. Healers. I recognize and tend to the generational and current traumas caused by oppressive systems, institutions, policies, and practices. Storytellers. I craft and share our community stories, cultures, experiences, histories, and possibilities through art, music, media, and movement. And her last role is guides. I teach, counsel, and advise using my gifts of well-earned discernment and wisdom. So her roles are weaver, experimenter, frontline responder, visionary, builder, caregiver, disruptor, healer, storyteller, and guide. And we can be in different roles at different times in our lives, but we are often drawn toward one or two and drawn away from a few others. That being said, when needed, we can often fill roles that we'd rather not adopt. Someone who hates public speaking can still address a school board when needed. Someone who is a doer and not a planner can, when convinced it's necessary, bring great insight into making sure people and strategies are aligned and planned. And a lot of what she's doing with this map is creating a culture not only of clarity about the roles we like to live, but gratitude for the roles others like to enact. For social change needs all of these roles to be enlivened to occur in any kind of sustained way, and none of us can enact them all. We all have to be present and engaged, giving our gifts as we can and grateful for what everyone gives, even if it's very different than what we can offer. Often in justice movements, we spend more time critiquing others, pulling in the same direction than we do pulling together toward change. 
In progressive justice movements, we can and often do inhibit the fullest expression of each other's gifts through judgment and criticism. We make each other unsure and insecure instead of courageous and joyful. Rather than face outward and direct our energy toward changing what ought to be different, we glad each other and the world as is moves on. When our first job in justice making is to relentlessly support others making justice, even when, especially when, they employ different holy gifts than we do. There are many things I like about Deepa Iyer's approach, and I'm not even really much of a chart guy, and I like it. But what I like the most is that by describing and linking all of these roles and directing them toward common values, she is structuring us for gratitude and change. Hers is not a spiritual approach, but it is full of spirit. It encourage, and it encourages us to be in our roles like Mother Cardinal to be and to explore new roles when the world opens up for that. And so as we ride through these days, journeying toward justice atop a horse that has a will and orientation of its own, past a blur of possibilities and concerns, we can remember that we each have our gifts to offer, and so does everyone else. And we can practice gratitude for all of them. And along the way, more sure of our gifts, more grateful for those of others, we can cultivate the real strength of interconnectedness, which is to know that together we can do anything, certainly endure, certainly be resilient, and certainly leave things better for those to come. Alone, we can't do any of that, but together, the journey, though fraught, can lead to greater peace, greater love, and to greater justice. Together in each of our roles, and playfully and courageously blurring them from time to time, we can support a great and growing journey toward more justice for more people, for more beings, for Gaia herself. We can be proud of one another and proud not of what any one can do, but of what we can all do together. We can learn to cherish the roles we don't fill more than the ones that we do and imbue every journey toward justice with an other focused ethic of nourishment and creativity that leaves nothing but blessings and goodness in its wake. We can build in each other the resilience, endurance, and even joy that makes every journey toward justice life affirming and holy. We can know that we're not in control of everything, but have some control over some things, our inner states of being, and how we engage others. And we can be and do in alignment with that passing eternal whisper that guides us to the good again. We can breathe and love, we can breathe out peace. We can reach out in love and we can reach out in peace, all in increasing balance, all in increasing harmony, and all in increasing gratitude for one another and our many and varied journeys toward justice. May it be so, and amen. All right, friends, stick around after the benediction. We'll open up the chat and turn off the mute control so that we can say good morning to one another. For our benediction, go forth grateful for the moments before you, the breath within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you toward lives of greater love, beauty, and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with everyone else by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace and amen.